of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Iram Sir Karen Nicolin. I call Karen Nicolin. Melgut, last can call your question over here in question number one. Can I welcome the <coughs> members uh, interested in this subject. I'm sure all the farmers in North Belfast will be delighted uh, with their putting the question down. And uh, I will be making an announcement shortly on the arrangements and funding for direct payments in the 2020 scheme year. The Chief Secretary to the Treasury at the end of December 2019 confirmed that the UK Government will provide the same financial support to cap Pillar 1 for 2020 as for the 2019 scheme year. Last year, the Northern Ireland Assembly, or last week, the Northern Ireland Assembly agreed a legislative consent motion on the direct payments to farmers legislative continuity bill. This allowed the provisions of the UK bill to extend and apply to Northern Ireland and to provide continuity for direct payments for the 2020 scheme year. The bill has now completed the stages in Parliament and became law on the 31st of January. And on that basis, I expect the 2020 scheme year to operate in a broadly similar way to 2019. In, future to relation, in relation to future years, the Conservative Party manifesto stated that funding for farm support would be maintained at existing levels until the end of this Parliament. While the schemes themselves may change across the UK, um, I anticipate that, that funding levels will be maintained up until 2024. My department will continue to work <coughs> on developing policy to the longer term, and I will be looking at what future payments can do to support sustainable farming and our landscape. thank the Minister for his response. And the Minister should know that I have been following the single farm payments in North Belfast quite eagerly, <laughs> given the announcement given the announcement that he made last week, so it should come as no surprise to him, but I thank him for his answer anyway. In relation to the basic payments and then to ensure that they are maintained, will the Minister make arrangements to meet with the British Treasury, and certainly in the light of Brexit, to ensure that these payments are not detrimentally impacted? Thank you. Well, I have already raised the, the issue with the Prime Minister, and in particular the fact that Northern Ireland is a producer of around 10 per cent of food in the UK um, cannot go down the route of a Barnett formula being applied to this, uh, which would be 2.8 per cent, which would be a huge detrimental loss uh, to the farming community here. I further raised that uh, with Theresa Villiers, the DEFRA uh, Minister, and I raised it this morning, DEFRA Secretary, and I raised it this morning uh, with Minister Duncan. And thus far, I have um, got good feedback from all three, and I will continue to press that issue. Here I am, sir. Matthew Toole, for your case, to call Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, Brexit threatens the very fabric and foundation of agriculture, farming, and rural communities in Northern Ireland. I know the minister supported Brexit; that is his right, and he is entitled to celebrate it. Um, but I would ask, since we know that Brexit threatens the majority of um, farmers' income in Northern Ireland, notwithstanding the statements he has made about the next few years and the partial guarantees we have over farm income, the threat of cheap food coming in as a result of trade deals that Boris Johnson wants to sign around the world. While I would not ask the Minister to recant on his support in Brexit, can I ask the Minister that he uses his office and the platform he has and the role he has to stand up for the closest possible alignment between the United Kingdom and the European Union, because that is, I am sure, what the Ulster Farmers Union and all farming representatives will be telling him. Well, I, I take his remarks as being condescending towards the farming community, um, because the feedback that I got from the farming community was that they extensively backed leaving the European Union. And if anybody wants an evidence base for that, the Farmers Union held a meeting at Ballamore, where 600 farmers turned up to it, and there was a 90 per cent vote in favour of leaving the European Union. So I think farmers know more about what will affect them and their future better uh, than the member who asked the question, representing South Belfast, and having only returned uh, from London to do so. In terms of this, I would say that 80 to 90 per cent of regulation within Europe is currently the case in Australia, in large parts of North America, and other key areas. So this business about regulatory alignment is, 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 is something which already exists in many areas. But if you are telling me that, for example, the slurry ban has been something which is good for Northern Ireland, it has not been. This last month, farmers have not been able to get out 
uh, and, and do that activity whenever the weather lent itself to actually doing it. If you're telling me that it's a good thing that farmers have to request permission to clean out a shuck and a department official is supposed to give that to them, if you're telling me it's a good thing that a farmer is not allowed to plough over the win winter because of soil erosion, which doesn't exist in this damp climate, those things are not good regulations. And I would happily digress from what Brussels has instructed us to do and the 2,800 regulations that have been imposed upon us since 1974. There are many of them are not fit for purpose here in Northern Ireland. Yeah. I call John Blair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware from a uh, debate last week around the legislative consent mechanism that there is concern uh, and real concern out there that the uh, measures emanating from that LCM do not uh, totally cover all pillars currently covered by the existing cap. Can I ask Deputy Speaker what, may, what, what action the Minister has taken to date to address that? And will he be meeting, if he hasn't already, the Ulster Farmers Union to discuss that? Well, I'm meeting the Farmers Union tomorrow, so if they have issues of concern, I'll be very happy to listen to them. Uh, but in respect of it, all of the evidence that I have found is that we will be able to um, carry out uh, everything in relation to what was in the cap pillar one, with one exception. And it's a very good exception, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Because of EU rules, in tw October 2016, this year, we give 70 per cent of the funding to the farmers. In October 2020, because we're out of the European Union, we will give 100 per cent to the farmers. I don't think the Farmers Union will be objecting to that. Question number two has been withdrawn, so I move then to question number three. I, I guess I am Sir Catherine Kelly for your cash. I'll call Catherine Kelly for a question. Grow Mayor Goodlast, Ken Corley, cash ever a tree. Question three, Minister, please. Thank the member for the question, and I am aware of the difficulties experienced by the farmers affected by flooding in 2017. And in the immediate aftermath of the flood, workshops were held in affected areas to provide advice and practical support <coughs> covering farm management issues and land restoration. Technical bulletins were also issued, and more recently, officials have met with local residents to explore well-being and business development matters. In terms of financial assistance, in 2017 the Department took steps to make enhanced advance cap payments at the rate of 70 per cent to help alleviate cash flow issues experienced by farmers. In addition, the Department approved force majeure declarations on affected farmland, which has been submitted for basic pay payment scheme support at the time, thus ensuring no reduction in, the, in those payments due to flood damage. DERA has since provided half a million pounds of funding to Locks Agency to carry out remedial repair and fencing works in the worst affected areas. And this repair work commenced in November 2019 and is ongoing. Under its statutory conservation and protection remit, the Locks Agency continues to undertake work in the affected areas. Catherine Kelly. Supplementary question for Catherine Kelly. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Minister, can you give any timeline as to when this funding will be issued to affected farms? Well, in terms of the, the funding that was identified, that has been uh, issued, and the Department is carrying out um, the fencing work, uh, which was damaged uh, during the flooding um, currently uh, from November. Call Tom Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the Minister for his response so far. But in the event of an aid, aid package coming forward, can the Minister advise how that um, uh, all farmers that were affected, some were affected a lot more than others, but how that all those farmers affected would uh, benefit from that in a fair and equitable, ba uh, equitable basis? If we were to do a scheme, and the official recommendation is that we don't do a scheme. Let's be very clear about that. If we were to do a scheme, it will be a hardship scheme, and that hardship scheme would be based on a ministerial direction. Ministerial directions are something which are used exceptionally, but nonetheless are used. So, for example, I used ministerial direction in a previous department and was criticised by the media for doing it, and in that instance it was uh, giving money uh, capital money to the Northern Ireland Hospice and to MENCAP for two absolutely brilliant schemes that they carried out. And they uh, criticised me for diverging from the advice of officials. So if I was to do um, a scheme in this instance, 
it will be something which diverges from officials and will be something that I will have to give ministerial direction to do on the basis of hardship. And that's something, uh, a decision that I haven't taken at this point. Dolores Kelly for your cash. Dolores Kelly for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, you will be aware that uh, other areas have also uh, flooded extensively over the last number of years, and some of that has actually impacted on the local fishing <coughs> community around Loch Ney. Uh, will there be any consideration given uh, to, uh, p to other industries, such as the fishing industry? I think the member has just highlighted one of the problems that I, I would have uh, in going against the advice of officials because they are concerned of the setting precedent. And uh, the member has just demonstrated <coughs> that this is not something which will be confined to one area. And if I do uh, take some action, that it may be something that others use as precedents uh, for further actions in, in, in later times. Call Steve Egan for a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker and the Minister. Uh, will the de minimis continue to be an issue now that we're no longer a member of the EU? Um, well, it's, it's something that, that I can do if I wish to do it, um, but I need to be convinced of the merits of it and of the true hardship uh, that, that has come about as, as a result of what happened. And I think that there is. Uh, a lot of merit in the argument that, uh, that has been made by members for West Tyrone uh, that there has been real hardship caused, uh, but nonetheless, um, it's going to be a very challenging decision for me to make, and it's one that I want to give absolute thought to. Call Claire Bailey for a question. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. It's good to hear the Minister um, is signalling his, um, his willingness to stick to ministerial direction. I'm wondering if he would be just as keen to maybe stick to the direction from this House. And I'm thinking of his uh, call last week to not call a, a, an inquiry into the Maboy waste dump, um, despite the unanimous support from all in this House to do so. Well, it's not a particularly relevant to the question, but um, the member will find that I'm a very independent-minded person. Um, but nonetheless, I also uh, would like to think that I'm reasonably fair and uh, try to take everything into account. And uh, I can deal with, with, with the issue that has been raised uh, at the appropriate time uh, in the appropriate questions. Irem Sir, Sinead Bradley for your cash. I call Sinead Bradley for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four. Thank the member for the question. And I am sympathetic to the creation of a register of those convicted of animal welfare offences. However, responsibility for doing so is not entirely within my gift, as conviction data is strictly controlled and managed by the Department of Justice. This matter has been considered in detail by my Department and the Department of Justice as part of the review of the implementation of the Welfare of Animals Act, Northern Ireland 2011, which was published in February 2016. The creation of such a register <coughs> is very complex and would require data, protection, human rights and prohibitive cost issues to be overcome. My officials have engaged with the Department of Justice on the matter and will continue to do so in order to explore if these issues could potentially be resolved. I am minded to raise this issue with my ministerial colleague, Naomi Long, with responsibility for the Department of Justice in the first instance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the reply from the Minister, but given the horrific and often stomach-churning um, incidents that have been reported of anim animal cruelty in recent times, I, I do think the impediments you raise are fair at this time, but I think there is an urgency in getting past them and finding a way of moving forward on this. And I would ask the Minister, in his um, role on the Brexit Committee, uh, obviously it's a changing world, and he would commit and give an assurance that he will find ways in making sure that these culprits have no place to hide, and that he works with both um, the UK and the Irish Government to find a way of making this register a, a real live document. I wholly appreciate the, the, the member's view of this, and I actually share her view, and just give a few of the difficulties that have been faced in other jurisdictions. In England, DEFRA has fielded a number of similar requests, um, and it encountered similar difficulties to those found in Northern Ireland regarding access to information in a register and important legal issues about um, data processing and transfer. DEFRA's view was that the police national computer is to all intents a register for offenders. Uh, though access to it is limited exclusively to the police. The RSPCA and local authorities, therefore, 
don't have access to the information except in uh, limited purposes. In Wales, in 2017, <coughs> the Government there created a Ministerial Task and Finish Group, which was chaired by the RSPCA, to explore options for an animal um, offenders register for Wales. And the group produced a number of recommendations, but was not able to recommend the development of an animal offenders register. <laughs> And that view was accepted by the Minister. And they found that there were significant barriers to the creation of the register, for example, the legal obstacles that could not be overcome by data sharing. And the group stated that where registers had been established, there was absence of evidence to prove their effectiveness. In particular, the group observed that increasingly animal welfare agencies in the USA, which first introduced uh, registers, were concluding that they do not work. The Republic of Ireland do not have any plans to introduce an animal offenders register, and the Scottish Government has no plans to develop a register. I actually would like to develop the register. I will engage with Minister Long in an attempt to see if we can be lead the way on it and overcome on this issue. Um, but I, I do not want the, the House to think that this is something that will be easy to do. Clearly, if others have tried it and have not uh, been able to, to deliver, it is something which is hugely complex. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he will prove himself to be a Minister for Animal Welfare by introducing comprehensive anti-animal cruelty legislation to include a ban on hunting with dogs and on the use of snares? Well, we, we have previously uh, demonstrated uh, how we support animal welfare, and, and I was very heavily involved um, as a member of the Assembly and a member of the Justice Committee in bringing forward the toughest legislation on cruelty to animals anywhere in the, these islands. So I think that I don't have to prove myself to the member. I've already demonstrated what I'm worth in these issues, and we look logically at all of these matters. Call Trevor Clark. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I listened carefully to what the Minister said in terms of these registers don't necessarily work in all our areas. Indeed, I think I would concur with that, Minister. So maybe would the Minister work with his other colleagues in relation to actually uh, working against those who finish up on a register to make sure that the penalty for those actually involved is much more severe rather than actually recording names for many of us which would know what names will appear on it anyhow? Well, I think we we'll probably all recall the, the awful case of, of Cody the dog, which my colleague, uh, Mr. Given, w w was heavily involved in, in raising all of the issues surrounding that, which did end up in a custodial sentence. Um, but in my view, an individual who caused such suffering to that animal should never be allowed to keep an animal in his life again. Um, and, you know, we, we had other incidents which have been very clearly um, came across on, on our, our news screens over the years where people have been successfully prosecuted. And what we have heard from those prosecutions is truly awful. So we do need to be taking actions to ensure that people who go out of their way to be, to be cruel to animals and, and, uh, and, and doing real harm to animals, uh, that we can take actions against them. And one of those actions that I want to see taken against them is that they would never be able to keep animals. And therefore, that is why I have a, a substantial sympathy um, to the, uh, the originator of, of the question, um, because I think that having a register may be helpful in, in allowing us to do that. I'm just saying it's going to be very difficult to create. We move now to question number five, and I call Mr. Jim Allister. Question five. Thank the member for his question. And in the calendar year since 2015 um, to date, 52 people have been convicted of illegal waste disposal offences through the criminal courts. And of the 52 convicted, one person was sentenced to a custodial term of six months' imprisonment. Would the Minister agree with me that um, that ratio of effective deterrent uh, in prison, by way of prison sentence is disappointing? Because this is a scenario where very severe harm has been done by illegal uh, waste disposal. Uh, and yet to find that only one person has paid with their liberty is surely disappointing. Could he tell us, since much of this illegal waste came, we are told, from the Republic of Ireland, what progress has there been in securing recompense from the authorities in the Republic in respect of these matters? Um, there are two, member, or two, two issues which I think the, the, the member uh, raised, and they are both um, valuable. 
In terms of recompense, um, there were 17 sites which was identified as waste having emanated from the Republic of Ireland, and of those 17, 11 of those sites have been repatriated, six haven't. And I'd have to say that those sites go back in excess of 10 years, because the course of work of repatriation started whenever I was Minister, which was from 2009 to 2011, and started as a result of me actually writing to the European Commission um, as a backbench MLA, I think it was in 2006. So that's a course of work that started and was never completed. So once the, the new minister is in place, I'll be uh, making a phone call and, and wanting to know when they're taking the, the waste from the other six sites. As a result of the Mills review after Muboy, uh, one of the recommendations that came from Mills was that we had worked through the Department of Justice to persuade the judiciary of the seriousness of waste crime, not just to the environment, but to the economy of Northern Ireland, and to encourage them to ensure that sentencing for these offences is incomparable to that in the rest of the United Kingdom. There is huge money to be made from waste crime, and slaps on the wrist won't cut it when dealing with these criminals. Mark Durkin for a question. I call Mark Durkin for a question. I would to thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Ms Bailey beat me to the question, but maybe I'll beat her to the answer. If I could ask the, the Minister uh, to outline to the House the rationale behind his decision uh, to dismiss uh, calls for a public inquiry into the huge illegal dump at Maboy, how that happened and potentially who, how that was allowed to happen. Well, um, it's actually very appropriate to raise a question under this one, so I'm very happy to, to, to answer Ms Durkin and Ms Bailey in this instance, uh, even though it came from somebody else. Um, nonetheless, the sentiment came from her in the first instance. Um, we did establish, or, or the, the Mills Review was established um, subsequent to uh, that decision in the Assembly, and it identified a number of issues arising. And sometimes... <laughs> I find judicial or, uh, inquiries tend to be slow, expensive, laborious, and very often deliver us answers which we already knew um, quite a number of years in advance. So public inquiries are not always the answer to everything. So this is the, these are the recommendations, and people can, can, can suggest if, if there's something has been missed, and I'm very happy to listen. But the DOE should make outcome of the waste sector that complies with the law protects the environment and underpins resource efficiency a priority. It should develop a comprehensive strategy with a detailed action plan to achieve this outcome, which initially focuses on preventing waste crime. Create a new single directorate within NIA to bring together the existing regulatory and enforcement teams, along with the new intelligence unit, to achieve the above. Adopt and develop the concept of intelligence and regulation in order to be sufficiently adaptive to deal with a range of operators from the criminal to the compliant, um, change the current appointment and recruitment processes to allow the targeted recruitment and appointment of staff with the right aptitude, skills and experience to carry out that regulatory work. This should be supported by structured training, professional development and defined career structure. Review in an integrated way need for additional powers to carry out this work by means of a task and finish group and involving all relevant DOE units, including planning with legal support and input from the PSNI. I have a room for another 40 seconds, Mr. Depp. Thank you. Making it harder for waste to fall into the hands of criminal operators by strengthening the duty of care provisions, fit and proper person test, and systems for monitoring and analysing waste flows. Limit the number of waste authorisations to the number necessary to meet Northern Ireland's projected waste needs and create the necessary new strategic waste infrastructure, which can be more easily regulated and monitored. Make changes to the current planning enforcement policy to no longer allow for the granting of retrospective planning permission to sand and gravel workings, work through the Department of Justice to persuade the judiciary well have done that one, create a new sanction in the legislation to make the polluter pay, or remediate or remove illegally deposited waste, and ensure that DOE works more closely with other government departments and agencies in Northern Ireland, and with environmental agencies in the UK and Ireland, and throughout relevant European organisations and initiatives. So there's a lot of things there that we could do and should do. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. 
and hopefully the Minister's answer will be briefer this time round. In, in light of the professed collegiate approach across all parties of this Assembly to protect and cherish our environment, would the Minister commit to a review of judicial penalties for illegal waste disposal with the Minister of Justice and go further to invest in a, an additional aspect uh, of education as a preventative manner for future proofing? Yeah, well, in terms of um, sentencing, fines have ranged from £100 to £40,000 and there has been a range of suspended terms of imprisonment, <coughs> sentences, community service orders being handed down to criminal courts, and the majority of conviction, convictions have been on the indictment at the Crown Court. So we do need to ensure that the penalty matches the crime. And if the crime is something where people are making hundreds of thousands, even millions of pounds, and they get a penalty of £10,000 in, that's not appropriate. So in all of that, that is something I'm very happy to, to work through, to look at with the Department of Justice to ensure that um, the polluter pays and pays heavily. Call Johnny Buckley. Speaker, the Minister is well aware of the large-scale dumping of illegal tyres that I had to deal with in my own constituency at the Birches Portadown Down last week. Can he outline what his department can do to help support rural communities that are very often left with the aftermath? Well, the department has a, has a polluter pays principle, but identifying the polluter in these instances are incredibly difficult. And I've been aware of this happening in, in quite a number of locations, even across uh, my own constituency, where a truckload of tyres is basically driven into the countryside, tipped off in the lane, and someone else has to pick up the responsibility of dealing with that, and it's grossly unfair. And I should say that when I was in the DOE uh, department, there was a lot of opportunities to deal with waste tyres and deal with them in a way which I believe would have been beneficial to the environment. And I regret that some 10 years later, we're still dealing with the same problem. And there hasn't been the advances in dealing with waste tyres that there should have been. Obviously, the companies the tyre companies receive money from every individual that has a tyre changed, and therefore we should be able to identify where each of those tyres go. And in instances where those companies' records don't stack up, we should be able to look at prosecution. Call Andrew Muir. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, in relation to the issue of illegal dumping and environmental crime, what plans are there to devolve more powers to local government so they can enforce this? Because they are at the, the coal face in relation to an awful lot of this. Well, again, I'm very happy to work with local government on the issue. At the minute, um, we, we in NIEA would be taking the lead on this issue. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a power that local governments necessarily want, um, but it's something that I'm prepared to talk to Nilga about. If we can do it a better way. I'm happy to look at doing it a better way. Okay, I call Rachel Woods for a question. Um, does the Minister agree that a budget of £143,000 per annum for clean-up of smaller-scale waste deposits is enough, where the offender cannot be identified, and that that budget is being used effectively, not as reactive, but to effectively stop illegal dumping? Well, that is a relatively small budget, and that is, that is used in instances where we are not catching the people. And having a, a larger budget for, for, for that purpose um, may not be well placed in that ultimately we want to, to stop it in the first place and take the actions to stop it happening. And number two, if it does happen, we want to take action against individuals who don't. So this is a, the area of last resort um, where neither of the first two have worked and therefore we don't really want to see a huge amount of money expended cleaning up after other people's bad behaviour. Mr Robinson, we may be able to get your question in briefly here. So. Question six, Mr Deputy Speaker. The case numbers were acquired by European Commission regulations, and as we now left the EU, my officials will take the opportunity to review the allocation process where possible. They will simplify and streamline the process to reduce both the administrative burden on farmers applying for business ID and the length of time that they have to wait for ID after applying, while still making sure that business IDs are only, only allocated to authentic farm businesses. The process for allocating business IDs allows my officials to ensure that funding goes to genuine and separate farm businesses and that farm businesses are not artificially claimed, cre created to claim grants to what they are not entitled to, nor to avoid legal obligations at farm level. Time for a very brief supplementary. And answer. <coughs> 
Would the Minister agree that members of the Young Farmers Scheme have been working on the farm and they are taking over or inheriting or disadvantaged by the six-year rule under CTY TAN, which prevents them applying for planning permission for a dwelling which could seriously impact their ability to operate their business? Well, each farmer, of course, is allowed every 10 years to, to make application. Um, so uh, that goes with the farm, not with the individual. And if there are two separate and distinct farms, um, then they will be able to apply for, for uh, two, two sites every 10 years. But that needs to be the case that there is a, a separate and distinct farm unit. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the that ends the period for listed questions. We now move to the topical questions in 15 minutes. I guess you sir, Shane Dennis, when you cashed it, that all. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, as I'm sure the Minister will be aware, Down Royal Racecourse is the only racecourse that offers Grade 1 racing in the north. It holds a unique place at the shop front of the Irish equine industry here, with over 1,000 thoroughbred horses and breeders, um, with a direct spend by the entire sector estimated by Deloitte to be between £170 million and £212 million per year. Unfortunately, Down Royal's status as a Grade 1 racecourse has been put in jeopardy. Due to difficulties, Down Royal Park have experienced drawing down funding from the Horse Racing Fund. Can I ask the Minister, is he aware of the, the funding difficulties facing Down Royal Park? Yes, and I thank the member for raising the question. Uh, it happens to fall in my constituency, and uh, I'm aware because of the change of ownership that this is being used um, not to pay the money to Down Royal. And that is entirely wrong, in my opinion, because uh, whilst the ownership has changed, the functions haven't changed. Um, the race course hasn't changed, and the purpose of it hasn't changed. So, um, I, I would be supportive of the industry pay, paying up, um, and that is the betting industry, gambling industry, uh, to the Down Royal in this instance. Jane Cash, Dorlinta, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I accept the Minister has said he's, uh, he's aware of the issue. Will you commit to, to sorting out the funding issues for Down Royal Park, and how will you prevent this issue from arising in the future? Well, <clears throat> yes, we will we'll continue to work on this and, and to look at it and to also look at seeing if we can amend um, the regulations around us so that if an ownership changes um, but the purpose uh, continues to be the same, then that the others would not be able to, to drop out of previous agreements. Uh, Catherine Kelly, for your case. Catherine Kelly, question. Gormeo, good last, Ken Coria. Minister, can you outline what steps your department is taking to address the issue of falling farm income, which fell by a staggering 25 per cent between 2018 and 2019, and is further compounded by the uncertainties created by Brexit? Well, in terms of the falling income, um, we do live in a scenario of, of global markets. And on some, some years we, we will do better because others have been less fortunate than ourselves. And then um, sometimes you get major floods. In Australia, for example, you've had major fires this year. And those things generally have an impact on, on global prices. Uh, but in this, this last year, we have seen, as, as the member has said, that the prices have fallen by um, over 25 per cent. And that is from a pretty low base in the first instance. Uh, I do think that in the United Kingdom in particular, that there are three people who benefit from um, food production, um, and that is the farmer, the processor, and the supermarket. And obviously, the consumer uh, has to pay for what is offered. And the farmer always seems to be the one who is getting the poor return vis-à-vis uh, -vis the processor, and in particular, the supermarkets. And I believe that some of the things that are being imposed, particularly by the supermarkets, are grossly unfair, and they will lead to um, farmers receiving very poor prices. And I make the argument we have adopted a policy in this House, uh, in the Assembly here, uh, of fair trade, and that is to ensure that coffee farmers, for example, in, in, in South America, uh, farmers who are producing quality fruit in, in um, West Africa, and so forth, get a decent price for their, for their goods, and we should ensure that um, the farmers here in Northern Ireland get a decent price for their goods as well. Cash to Tax supplementary question. Thanks, Minister. Do you recognise that with the ending of the areas of natural constraint com compensatory payment that this is a further blow to the income of hill farmers? 
Well, that decision was taken uh, some years ago, and it finally closed then in 2018. Uh, so I think going forward, we need to look at new ways of providing support for um, farmers. And I have indicated uh, to the committee on Thursday that hill farmers are so important um, to our ecosystem, to our environment, and to the production of really good quality um, goods, uh, which very often are finished down in the lowlands. But nonetheless, the role of hill farmers is absolutely critical going forward. So, in terms of devising a scheme um, beyond uh, 2020, I want to devise a scheme uh, which is good for hill farmers, uh, good for all farmers, but I want it to be good for hill farmers. They, I don't want them to be left behind. Colin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, when does the Minister envisage the establishment of an independent environmental protection agency in light of the commitment given in the New Decade New Approach document? Well, obviously, we're having a debate on that issue uh, later on, um, and we knew it in uh, GB that they're establishing an Office of Environmental Protection as well. So, in all of that, um, is an independent environment agency in place of NIA? Or is it in addition to NAA, as the Independent Protection Agency? Is it to oversee, for example, what previously the European Commission would have overseen? And therefore, it is something which is done uh, in, in, alongside the NIA? Or is it something which we would see entirely replacing the NIA? Um, so, that, that, that is a discussion that we all need to have at executive level to see the best way forward. Mr. Muir, supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and for the Minister for his response. Uh, with that uh, office being established in England and Wales, and already an agency in Scotland and an agency in Ireland, do you not think that there is a risk of Northern Ireland being left behind in terms of the British Isles with regards to environmental governance, especially in light of our exit from the European Union? Well, I think that we do have some very good environmental standards here in Northern Ireland, and NAA work, work hard on, on many of those things to ensure um, that we actually do our, our jobs well and ensure that the environment is protected. <coughs> I think that in terms of the independent environmental protection agency, it's not something that I'm um, you know, opposed to. I'm not. I, 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 want, I want to look at all of the issues around it and see what is the best way forward. I do know that, for example, in Aberdeenshire, with an independent environmental protection agency, um, they were able to pass an incinerator in six months. Uh, where Northern Ireland is 10 years later, um, they're still arguing about it. So, in suggesting that things may be a lot tighter as a result of an independent DPA, they may not be, and they may, may be less, less inclined to have political influence from wherever it happens to come, whether it be people who want less regulation or more regulation. Um, they may be less inclined to ha have that influence uh, upon them. Uh, so it is a matter that, that I think that we all need to look at very, very seriously, and it is certainly not something that I am ruling out. Jerry Carroll for Hon Yukesh. Thanks, Carr. Mr Speaker. I just want to ask the Minister, given the clear evidence that our pollution is, a dangerous, uh, is at dangerous levels across Belfast, with, for example, the Stockmans area uh, in my own constituency and the outskirts of my own constituency being one of the worst flashpoints uh, for pollution levels, will the Minister outline if he has any plans to tackle the growing threat of our pollution during his time uh, in office? Well, certainly one of, the, one of the, the greatest areas of air pollution is transportation. And uh, combustion engines, I, I suppose, are, are the greatest source of that. And members indicated problems around an area where obviously cars um, aren't moving very quickly. So, actually, going ahead and, and, and having one of the, the blockades, blockades uh, to vehicles moving, uh, which is at the, the Westlink M2 interchange, uh, would be something which would be hugely beneficial. I also think something which would be beneficial. Uh, would be for us to look at how we can support more electric cars on the road. And currently, we are providing all of the electric points at uh, public cost. I know that in the Republic of Ireland that that is being done on a 50-50 basis. So the private sector is contributing to that. Um, so we need to be flexible and ready to move and assist people to move to electric cars because in Northern Ireland. We are producing well over 40% of our electricity from renewable sources. 
So cars run on electricity here, you know, you are getting a genuine um, good coming from that. Where, for example, in Germany, 37% of their electric comes from coal-fired power stations. So moving to an electric car in Germany may actually be more harming to the environment. Uh, whereas in Northern Ireland, because we have ploughed ahead uh, with renewable energy, um, we, we actually have a great benefit from moving down that particular route. Kesh Dorlinta, when you Jerry Carroll, supplementary question Th for Jerry. Thank you, Minister, for his reply. And I would add to that, obviously, investment in cycling and public transport uh, is very, very important as well. Would the Minister and his officials, uh, officials be happy to meet with myself alongside some of the residents in that Stockman's area to talk about what he can do and his department can do to alleviate some of those levels of air pollution? Of course we would. I am um, of the opinion that I am here um, to serve um, the people in this Assembly because they serve the people of Northern Ireland, so I um, would be happy to, to meet yourself. Again, a North Belfast question. Uh, so what I want to know is, can the Minister provide an update on the delays to the Northern Ireland Food Animal Information, please? Back to the Northern Ireland. Food animal information. Uh, I'm not exactly sure um, of, of that one, uh, so I'll, I'll get a note off it and, and reply in writing to, to. Okay, I'll reply in writing to you on that one. I presume you'll not require supplementary or. Wanna... <laughs> <laughs> but I'll give you. I want to know about NIFAS. I can meet him after topical questions and give him an update. <laughs> That was supplementary, all right, to the Minister. Um, I call Mike Nesbitt for a question. Well, lucky old me. Uh, last week, the UK's Migration Advisory uh, Committee uh, recommended that uh, Tier 2 visas should not be granted to the fishing industry, given the fact that the local fleet is so dependent on foreign national workers. What is the Minister's assessment of the negative impact of this ruling on the local fisheries fleet? Well, uh, I was with the fishermen in Port of Ogi last, last week, uh, and I thank Harry Harvey for being in attendance at that meeting. And they raised the issue uh, in particular of the skills base within fishing and the fact that the people who are, are being brought in are not recognised as skilled workers, they're just recognised as labourers. And given the complexities that is involved in repairing nets, making nets, of actual catching, identifying of fish um, and all that goes with it, it is something which should be necessarily recognised um, as, a, as a skilled uh, workforce and consequently that is something that we will be pressing with national government um, that fishermen who are being brought in um, because a lot of our young people sadly have left the fishing industry as a consequence of the common fisheries policy, as a consequence of the, the actions that the European Union has taken. And when, when the United Kingdom gains its borders back, its 200-mile limit, there will be limitless opportunities for the fishing industry, yeah, yeah. and therefore we need these people to come and support us till we get our young people back into fishing. Yeah, Mike Nesbitt, yeah, yeah. supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And when we do take back the powers uh, and leave the common fisheries policy, does he believe that the new policy should be set by Westminster or devolved to Stormont? Um, th those policies will be set by devolved administrations on, on fishing and on, on what takes place in, in the waters. Um, however, policies on migration will remain with Westminster, and therefore it is up to us to maximise our influence uh, with Westminster to ensure that the right policies are applied to support what is, in Northern Ireland, a very good industry at producing high-quality food uh, for the many people who live in cities and in other parts of the United Kingdom. I call John Blair. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what action he has taken to increase the area excuse me, of woodland across Northern Ireland, which, uh, as far as I am aware, currently stands around 8 per cent, the lowest in fact in Europe? Uh, yes, he is right in pointing out the figure of 8 per cent. Um, however, we have some of the, the higher uh, margins when it comes to hedgerows. So you could drive through parts of Scotland and England where you will see various pieces of woodland, uh, but alongside the road there is nothing. Um, so we do have a lot of hedgerows, but I am committed to increasing the, the, the number of trees that are being planted. Currently my department um, plants around um, 2,000 uh, 2, hectares per year, um, so we want to, we want to increase, that, increase that significantly. 
Um, so um, we're plant planting around 2 million trees um, per annum, um, but I think that there's great opportunities to increase that. Time for a very brief supplementary announcement. Very, very briefly, Deputy Speaker, uh, would the Minister agree that there should be a joined up approach with local, local councils, uh, NGOs and voluntary bodies in that regard to increase the woodland as well as, of course, with the hedgerows? Yes, we have written to all of those bodies, all of the other departments, asking them to contact their arm's length bodies, local authorities, etc., to see what opportunities there is to plant public land. Uh, with trees. So that is something that we're already doing, and I'd encourage the member to encourage uh, departments to come back to us quickly because the sooner they come back to us, the sooner we can get on with the job of creating more woodland, which will be a great car carbon sink. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, before moving to the next question, time, Minister, if members just take their ease, uh, we'll change the chair here. Thank you.